Hello and welcome to our program on Yiddish and Klezmer music today. I've been, I am Mark Kligman, the director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience. And I also give you greetings from the YIVO Institute. And we're going to be introducing Alex Weiser today. And together through YIVO and the Lowell Milken Center at UCLA, uh, we have jointly come up with this three-part series. So we are glad you're with us today, and we hope you also join us for our two sessions next week. Today's session is going to be looking at the wonderful uh, new Yiddish music programs uh, that uh, have been curated at YIVO uh, through Alex Weiser. Next week, we're going to be looking at um, Klezmer music today through various uh, Klezmer music festivals, and we'll have the leaders and organizers of various festivals come to talk about the work that they're doing. And the third one on December 15th will be about the North American premiere of a Yiddish opera called Vas Sheva. So we hope you can join us for um, all of these events. They will be recorded and we hope you'll join us. Uh, I also want to thank the David Victor Foundation who has provided funding to us at the UCLA Milken Center that has made today's program possible. So with that, what I will do, um, I don't know who is sharing their screen. Um, Alex, is this something you're doing? Um, no, it looks like one of Susan, Sue Katz has accidentally shared her screen on her phone or tablet. I can hear, I've, I, uh, I think, um... oh, wonderful. There we go. Yeah. Hear that. All right. Thank you very much. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Alex Weiser. Broad gestures and rich textures are hallmarks of the compelling and deliciously wistful music of composer Alex Weiser. Born and raised in New York City, Weiser creates a, um, actually compositional music, combining a deeply felt historical perspective with a vibrant, forward-looking, creatively hailed as personal expression and bold. And these are all quotes from the New York Times, San Francisco, classical voice. And we are so glad that Alex is with us today. His debut album, And All the Days Were Purple, was named a 2020 Pulitzer Prize finalist incited as a meditative and deeply spiritual work whose unexpected musical language is arresting and directly emotional. Released by Cantaloupe Music in April 2019, the album includes songs in Yiddish and English. Active as an opera composer, Weiser is currently working on two operas, a commission from the American Lyric Theater and an opera exploring the story of the unfinished Great Dictionary of the Yiddish Language with librettist Ben Kaplan. Weiser recently completed another opera with Kaplan, State of the Jews, based on the story of Theodore Herzl, his wife Julie, and the toll his political activities took on their family life. And in knowing Alex and hearing him, knowing what he's doing, um, these operas the, are just wonderfully uh, crafted programs and just such interesting information. An advocate of contemporary classical music, Weiser co-founded Kettle Corn New Music, an ever enjoyable concert series, is quoted by the New York Times, and was director of the MATA Festival, the city's leading showcase for vital new music for emerging composers. Weiser is now the director of public programs at the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research, where he curates programs and has commissioned over 15 works from some of today's leading composers. And it's this activity of Alex that we're going to be looking at today. So Alex, again, thank you for being part of the co-sponsor of this program and um, welcome. Thank you so much, Mark, for that generous introduction. Um, so yeah, I mean, the thing that kind of kicked off this conversation was this festival that we did at EVO last May of concerts um, featuring Yiddish folk song and new takes on Yiddish folk song and old takes on Yiddish folk song. Um, but, you know, what we really do at Evo is with, with music in particular, um, is we try to shed light on 
all the wonderful music that we have in our collections. And we like to do that um, when we can by unlocking that material through the creativity of composers and, and contemporary artists that are engaging with it. Um, so when we're going to talk about Yiddish folk song today, I thought we could start by just kind of diving into, you know, what are some of the resources for Yiddish folk song at Evo, you know, that were really the impetus for why we did this festival in the first place, before we even get to, you know, what we did in order to showcase this material. Um, so I'll share my screen with the, with a little presentation with a few images. Just bear with me while I put this in presentation mode. So I just took a snapshot of a few of the great songbooks. Like they're, they're really wonderful songbooks um, and ethnographic collections of Yiddish folk song that exist. Like it's actually a very rich um, documentation of this uh, repertoire, which we're very lucky to have. Um, and this is just a sampling of kind of what I happen to have on my shelf. And I just pulled it off for this photo just to give a sense of, of that richness. Um, and, you know, songbooks, you know, what we have in the library and that are, exist in many libraries um, are usually the first stop shop when you're, you know, trying to get into um, Yiddish folk song. You know, what have people already transcribed and written about and translated? Um, so, you know, these are some great examples. Uh, but when you're ready to go deeper, we have really fantastic resources for that at Evo. So we have, for example, our mixed provenance music collection that we call RG112, Record Group 112, which is just the, how we organize our different collections at Evo. This is one of our big music collections. And in this collection, um, we have lots of pieces of sheet music uh, that are classical pieces, that are Yiddish theater music, that are choral music. Um, and among these pieces, there are a lot of um, pieces of music that are arrangements of or fantasies on or, you know, somehow based on Yiddish folk song. Um, so, for example, this kind of classic that started this whole repertoire out that we have, you know, in our stacks upstairs is Joel Engel's Yiddish Folks Leader, um, which is this is a really beautiful set of 20 um, songs that are arrangements of Yiddish folk songs. And the interesting thing about um, about these uh, Engel arrangements is that they are somewhere between a kind of ethnographic resource and classical compositions. You know, he talks in the preface to these to this volume about how, you know, if we actually go back to this first slide, this book on the on the top left here, Yiddish Folk Songs in Russia, this is a, a, a reprint of a classic book from the turn of the 20th century. Um, and this book only has texts of Yiddish folk songs. It was really important because it was the first book to kind of make a big compendium of Yiddish folk songs, actually of Jewish folk songs, because there are some in Russian and Hebrew, but it's mostly Yiddish folk songs. Um, but it didn't have the melodies. And so Engel in this cycle wrote, um, he he transcribed the melodies uh, so that you would have them for 20 of the songs in particular, first 10 and then another volume with another 10. Um, but he gave them accompaniments. And so he kind of turned them into classical compositions. And so we see that becomes a thread, you know, starting in the turn of the 20th century. Um, this is published in 1909, but in fact, it kind of is, is documenting work that, that started um, back to, you know, or, back even earlier. Um, and this he kind of creates this genre for Yiddish that had existed in other classical genres where you, know, you take folk songs and you you know put them in a kind of classical art song arrangement um, in order to showcase the song. So we've got these wonderful um, Joel Engel songs. We also have a lot of other songs. And so this whole organization kind of sprung up inspired by Engel's work um, called the Society for Yiddish Folk Music, um, Gesellschaft für Yiddish uh, Volksmusik. Um, and you can see here the beautiful um, design of their cover. And this is an example of a, of a piece that they published, which is uh, a kind of arrangement for voice and piano of a folk song by Lazar Siminski, um, Unter Sara Las Vigla, Under Sarah's Little, Under Little Sarah's uh, Little Cradle. Um, and there are tons of songs in this repertoire that this organization published and that others like it. And I just wanted to share these two in particular also because they have this lovely um, sheet music cover. Um, but when you're ready to go beyond the sheet music books, beyond the sheet music um, published that we have in our collection, we also have absolutely, you know, important resources of ethnographic recordings, which are, you know, a step deeper when you're ready to go further. And so two of the really important collections we have at Evo are this Ruth Rubin collection. Ruth Rubin was an ethnographer, a folk song collector, and a singer. 
Um, and she collected over 2,000 folk songs, and she gave Yivo a copy of her entire collection with all sorts of interesting papers and other things that go along with it. Um, and we have this at Yivo, and in fact, we've digitized most of it, and we have a portal, ruthrubin.yivo.org, where you can listen to these folk songs. This is like incredible, you know, not just can you find these, these books, that, you know, of, but 2,000 folk songs, you can go and listen to these recordings that Ruth Rubin made, you know, with a microphone and a, and a recorder at, in different places. Um, so that's an incredible resource. Um, and then another resource that we have at Evo is the, the Evo Folk Song Project. So in um, 1973, 1975, Evo um, led a project uh, led by Barbara Kirschenbach Gimblet um, to create more folk song recordings and oral histories of another 2000 folk songs or so. And the really interesting thing about this particular collection is that um, interviewers asked participants to talk about the folk songs and the context in which they were sung. And um, so it's it's not just folk songs themselves, but as a whole oral history around folk songs and their social context and about the singers who sang these folk songs. So it's a really invaluable resource when we want to dive deeper. And this we also digitized and you can access a, a link on the screen um, through YIVO's um, archive uh, repository system. So what if I want to stop screen and just talk a little bit, um, this was the impetus for creating this festival. You know, we've got this amazing corpus of Yiddish folk songs, you know, thousands of songs um, that are in these books, that are in these pieces of sheet music, that are recorded by Ruth Rubin, that are recorded by the Yivo Yiddish Folk Song Project. We have the, the books and the sheet music and the recordings available for people um, to look at, but we want to inspire people to really look at them and to to know that they're there um, and how do we draw attention to them that's kind of what we do with our work at evo with the public programs we try to draw people's attention to um, these amazing resources that we have at evo and these digitization projects that we've done and so on and so forth so we started this project to perform and um pieces Yes, I, I thought maybe be, before we transition, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, absolutely, yes. Focus on the festival. I just wondering if I could ask you just a couple of questions. One yeah, is, yeah, that'd be great. There's so many incredible resources that Evo has, and I'm sure many people on this call or in this this Zoom session know a lot about that. But I think you've done programs related to ha having people uh, be able to access Evo materials, and I just want to give you an opportunity just to share how people can find more. Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. So we have on our YouTube channel, um, and I can pull it up and hold on. I could pull it up and um, share a link, but we have a variety of programs we've done that show how to do research at Evo. So for example, this is how to do research at Evo in this particular collection, the Edward Blank Evo um, Build an Online Collections Project. Um, And we have two other programs. And excuse me, here's another one um, that kind of walk you through how research happens at Evo. Um, and in once you've watched these programs, if you still have questions, you can email. Um, I think the email address is. Hold on, I'll tell you. All right. Um, reference at evo.org, um, and they can help you with any with any research questions, but those are the three programs we have to kind of show how to do research at Evo. Um, and they they link off to some other helpful materials. So it, it can be daunting, but there's there are people to help. Wonderful. So I know we want to uh, transition into uh, the festival. So um, you were just to pick up the train of thought that you were saying <laughs> that that was really the impetus to really create this this festival. Yeah, so um, the existence of, of all of these collections and all this fascinating material that we want to draw people's attention to um, was the impetus to create this festival. And, and actually, it, it kind of started during the pandemic. Um, so we sort of jump started this with a few digital performances that led into what was ultimately a five event festival in person last May. Um, but I wanted to share from one of the digital performances um, a recording so you can get a sense for kind of like this music in your ear and um, and for one of the things that I showed you before. So one of the pieces I showed was 
Joel Engel's Yiddish Folks Leader from 1909. And um, this is like, as I was describing, it's a really important uh, piece in the history of doing things with Yiddish folk songs. Um, and yet, before you know, we did this concert, you couldn't actually hear the whole thing from start to finish anywhere, um, just snippets here and there. So we did an online concert during the pandemic. Um, we had wonderful uh, singer Lucy Fitzgibbon um, and her partner, who's a wonderful pianist, Ryan McEvoy McCullough, um, record the entire 20 song set. Um, and they did an absolutely fantastic job. It's on our YouTube channel. It's been viewed thousands of times. Um, and just to give you a taste of it, I wanna play uh, one of the songs. So I will share that right now. Uh, before I start playing, just I want to give you the the text is very simple. This is a um, it's the song that happens. Uh, it takes place after someone has just been wed and they're saying goodbye to their parents. So it's this kind of bittersweet part uh, departure. Farewell, my beloved parents. I'm embarking on a far off journey where no wind blows and where no bird flies and where no rooster crows. Farewell, my beloved parents. I'm leaving you. May God grant health and life and luck to me on my journey. So the really interesting thing about this song, it's a beautiful setting, um, but as I was saying, Joel Engel took this kind of ethnographic information of the melody and the words of the folk song, um, and he kind of created uh, his own musical setting of it, which kind of turns it into something like an art song. Um, and you know, this was one of the big genres that we were really interested in showcasing in this festival. Um, and so in, in all, there were really, I would categorize the music we showed in the festival as in three major groups. Um, one is, one are these pieces like this that are um, showcasing a Yiddish folk song, but that are old. You know, this is a piece from 19, uh, published in 1909 from even earlier. Um, and it documents this kind of way that Yiddish folk songs have been engaged with, by, you know, in a, in a written and composed music um, context. Uh, going back to the early uh, 20th century. So that's one of the categories. And there's lots of music in that category that we have in our collections that we want to showcase. Um, so that was one of the big things. Um, one of the- Mind oh, if I, yes. I ask you a question uh, about- Yeah, it? absolutely. So um, how would you, as a composer, you know, just describing the music of Engel, how do you uh, like engage with it in terms of what musical language there is and then how the performers sort of approach it? 
Yeah, I think that, you know, he's got a kind of um, late romantic, um, you know, or like musical style, which is, I think, kind of, in a way, has become the kind of lingua franca for like, set it like in terms of harmony for example um for some musical settings of yiddish folk song because you know one of the things that's important to remember when thinking about yiddish folk song is that in a uh natural kind of context it's per usually performed without accompaniment um you know solo sing people singing in a family context because we're talking about a repertoire um that you know is not a professional music repertoire. It's a it's a kind of personal home repertoire where people are singing to each other, to their children, um, you know, to themselves. And so in that context, we're really thinking about songs that are unaccompanied. Um, and so even just having harmony at all is a really big decision that Engel is making. But then other than making that decision, I think he makes he takes makes pretty kind of conservative, so to speak, musical judgments. You know, he's he's um, he's following what in a kind of Western classical music um, interpretation would be kind of the implied harmonies of the melodies. You know, he's not not nothing too avant garde. Um, you know, there's some nice expressive little touches in the harmony, but fairly straightforward. Um, and I think that that approach really speaks to his goals, which was that he wanted to kind of prop up these folk songs on a kind of classical stage and say, look here, look at this thing. Isn't it so beautiful? So he didn't want to draw attention to his musical choices too much. And so he made kind of simple, you know, kind of supporting supporting role um, choices. Um, but nevertheless, they still have this impact, you know, that, that it really brings it into a different genre at the same time. So it's a very interesting kind of, yeah, cross section or meeting point between these two musical languages. Great. Thank you. Um, so, so there, there are lots of pieces like this, and so we, we have lots of great one, examples in our um, collections, and we wanted to showcase them. Um, at the same time that you have this uh, history going back, you know, over a hundred years of people taking Yiddish folk songs and doing this kind of arrangement with them, um, you also have the whole time to this day a tradition of people doing, uh, continuing the kind of traditional singing approach to these folk songs. Um, and it has changed a lot over time because you don't have the kind of um, Yiddish language speech community that you had 100 years ago, um, where you have, you know, tons of mothers naturally singing Yiddish folk songs to their children, um, especially outside of the outside of the, the Haredi world. You know, Yiddish, it, there are there are some, but there are very few people who speak Yiddish as their mother tongue. Um, and so it becomes a kind of learned uh, tradition to take the torch of this um, Yiddish folk song tradition, but there are people who are taking that torch, and they're wonderful people, um, you know, singing in this kind of unaccompanied traditional style. So we wanted to showcase that too. So that's one of the other big threads um, in the festival. So I can um, I can share an example. So hold on, I'm gonna go back to that PowerPoint. We'll come back to this if we have time. All right, so this is the this is the translation actually for the um th this is, if you can just kind of take a quick glance, but this is a, a folk song that we're you're gonna hear rendered by um wonderful singer and violinist Eleanor Bazinski, uh, who's also my colleague at Evo. She works in the sound archive. Um, and she was, you know, one of the people that was instrumental in putting this festival together. Um, and yeah, well, let's listen. Let's listen to this folk song. Habe die gesucht, 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 als schein bin ich nicht, als schein bin ich nicht, als schein bin ich nicht. Hast du mir lieb, geh mal rein, was das Schöne hat sich ein. Ach, kein Schein sich nicht anhalten, ach, kein Schein sich nicht anhalten. Habe die gesucht, 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 als Geld habe ich nicht, als Geld habe ich nicht. 
Als Gehel darf ich nicht. Ich habe die gesucht, gesucht, gesucht. Als Gehel darf ich nicht. Als Gehel darf ich nicht. Als Gehel darf ich nicht. Hast du mir lieb? Geh mal rein. Willst du reichen? Halt dich ein. Ich kenn schön sich nicht anhalten. Ich kenn schön sich nicht anhalten. Ich habe die gesucht, gesucht, gesucht. Als ich es darf ich nicht. Als ich es hab ich nicht, als ich es hab ich nicht. Ich habe die gesucht, 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 als ich es hab ich nicht. Als ich es hab ich nicht, als ich es hab ich nicht. Hast du mir lieb, geh mal rein, willst du, ich es auf sich ein. Oh, ich kenn schön sich nicht anhalten, ich kenn schön sich nicht anhalten. Ich habe dich gesucht, 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 als Glück bin ich nicht. Als Glück bin ich nicht. Als Glück bin ich nicht. Ich habe dich gesucht, 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 als Glück bin ich nicht. Als Glück bin ich nicht. Als Glück bin ich nicht. Hast du mir lieb, geh mal rein, willst du Glück auf sich ein? Ah, ich kenn schön sich nicht anhalten, ich kenn schön sich nicht anhalten, ich kenn schön sich nicht anhalten. That's a beautiful song and uh, a great example of this unaccompanied um, Yiddish folk song genre. Um, and one of the interesting things about this particular song is that it's a love song. And of course, there are lots of Yiddish love songs, but it's uh, but it was a kind of um, stereotype that Jews didn't have love songs because they were in arranged marriages and it was all about religion. Um, but of course, Jews have love songs. And that this is just one example of how, you know, the Yiddish folk song corpus is an amazing snapshot. It's a window into you know, um, the life of the lives of Yiddish speaking Jews uh, who sang these songs and sang all sorts of songs. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so I can play another song from the kind of branching off of the traditional uh, singing um, world uh, in the same way that, you know, people like Joel Engel you know, wrote accompaniments and brought these folk songs into different contexts. That's also something that's happened within the world of, you know, so-called traditional Yiddish folk song singing um, as well. And you have people that, uh, you know, concertize as a traditional singers and that, you know, will play accompaniments um, with instruments. Um, and so we saw that on our festival as well. Um, and there was a wonderful song. We did a whole concert of, of specifically material celebrating um, this digitization of um, the Yivo Yiddish Folk Song Project. And we invited a whole um, group of, of contemporary um, Yiddish folk song singers to listen through the collection and choose something to learn and to perform. Um, and it was a wonderful concert. Um, and one of, the, one of the performances on this concert was a song that was unfamiliar to most of us um, before uh, doing this little mini research project um, that was picked chosen by Lawrence Glamberg, who's one of my other colleagues here at Evo, and also very instrumental and helpful in putting this festival together. Um, and Lauren found this song in one of the collections uh, digitized as a part of the Evo uh, folk song project called Dem Hare At, that were like the I do, right? Hare At is what you say at a wedding, a Jewish wedding. Um, but it's a kind of uh, silly song about how horrible getting married was and how it's how, nothing this person has experienced is worse than getting married. Um, it's a very fun song. And Lauren put it together with Eleanor and with a bunch of other um, colleagues who performed this concert. And they performed it in a kind of with an ensemble. So we'll we'll take a listen. Uh, but it's an interesting example of how even in this, you know, world of kind of traditional singing, there's branching off and there is using instruments and but um, bringing in other styles like Alma. So let's let's give that a listen. Ein Fell gelegen, 
slide is just to point out all the people's names as Lauren Sklamberg over here, um, Sarah Meyerson, Ilya Schneeweiss, Eleanor Bozinski, who we just heard in the previous song, uh, and Eleanor Weil. So certainly this effort to draw from the archives is really fueled so much of the klezmer and Yiddish uh, revival. Um, and I, I guess so much of it is still waiting to be discovered as well. Absolutely. I mean, there are you know, thousands of songs in each of these collections. Um, and there's also so much interesting material about the songs, you know, um, like I was saying about the Yivo Yiddish Folk Song Project, it's not just the songs themselves, but it's this whole oral history about the context of the songs and the singer of the so singers of these songs. Um, and so this whole rich world, which we're really only scratching the surface and, you know, putting together a festival like this was so much fun and it brought you know, dozens of people together in this task of unearthing this material and kind of like making interesting things out of it and bringing it to people and packaging in ways that we can share it. Um, and, you know, it, it resulted in this book, which is like 300 pages long and these um, four concerts and a panel discussion. So it was it was really a lot. And yet it's really just scratching the surface. There's so much interesting material um, waiting to be uh, played with and, and uh, sifted through. So I think you want to move on to another category. Yeah, so the other, um, the third kind of area. So just to recap, we have like these old um, settings of Yiddish folk song that are in our collection. Um, we have the kind of traditional singing um, approach of people, you know, treating it more as an oral um, history, an oral um, tradition um, that are singing on a company, but also that are singing a company and doing very interesting things with it is in that capacity as well. Um, and then, uh, we also, the third, this third category is we brought in composers from the outside uh, to listen to this music, to, to discover these folk songs for themselves and to do things with them. Um, and I, for me, this is, you know, a particularly interesting um, part of, of the scheme here because it um, it invites people with a, with a fresh and different perspective to kind of sift through this music, to join us and, and the, the people that are already devoted to the Yiddish music 
um, seem to join them and to explore and to, to learn and to see what they make of it. Um, so I, I want to share. Um, I want to share at least one of one of these, and if we have time, maybe more. But I want to start with this um, wonderful piece that um, Annie Gosfield wrote. So Annie Gosfield uh, is a wonderful composer who is based here in New York. She's from Philadelphia, um, and we've worked with her at Evo before. Um, and she she's a great example of a composer who is like really interested in the past, um, really interested in uh, Jewish identity but not a Yiddish speaker and not kind of like a part of the Yiddish music community. Um, and so for me, a really exciting person to kind of, you know, hey, hey, just to bring into Yiv and say, hey, Annie, listen to these recordings. This is so amazing. Do something with this. Um, let it, you know, be a part of your musical world. Um, and so I sent her uh, the Ruth Rubin website, um, which I'll, I'll navigate to in a moment because I want to show you the song that you listen to. And she listened to lots of recordings on the Ruth Rubin website, and she stumbled on this song, Alla Wasserlich Fliesen Avec. Um, and I'll just share the text briefly. This is um, a translation from Ruth Rubin, who actually sings the song in her own collection that we're gonna about to listen to. And she provides this translation in her um, little red book of Yiddish folk songs, which was in my first slide of some of the, the books. Um, so this is the text, and it's it's a it's a song about a broken heart, um, and it's just tragic and full of despair, and it's a beautiful song. Um, so I want to take us to the uh, Ruth Rubin website, and this is what the the website looks like. And if, if you can see, um, if I just navigate around this this image that I showed uh, to showcase what the fest what this um, collection looks like, it, it's used here on the the home page. Um, and there's some really interesting information about Ruth Rubin um, and her collecting on this web page um, and just fa fascinating background material about about the collection. Um, and you can you can then listen to the recordings and to, and sort through them. So the recording that I want is um, this all of us are Fleece and Evec. That's the recording that um, Annie Gosfield stumbled on and became really inspired by. And we can see here when I pull it up uh, that it was recorded in 1957 by Ruth Rubin herself. So mostly Ruth Rubin is out there recording other people, but she was interested because she was an amazing storehouse of folk songs that she herself had learned. And so she recorded re songs that she herself learned as well as a part of the collection. Um, and you can see it's it's the genre, it's in the love song genre, even though it's a sad, it's a heartbreak love song. Um, it was recorded here in New York. And yeah, so let's let's take a listen. It's about a minute and a half and it's a it's a beautiful little song. <laughs> Was all for a stain, mine of eighty. I the Ura Lech of Lien, the Ura Lech Tien. This I get a vec, we royer, in Nazir der Monzi, on dear my Zis Leben. Get me Royce der Koyer. And as a middle spiel the Liebe, spiel in your alle Farben, and as I spiel your Liebe nicht euch, kann sich alle noch starben. And as the Teppelach drücken in euch, bleiben sie alle Lady. In Azam Medale spielt ihr Liebe nicht euch, wird sie verfallen, muy fehlbe. So it's a, a beautiful song, and I want to wanna read to you, let me just find the right tab here. Um, I want to read to you what Annie Gosfield wrote about the song before we listen to her 
um, to her rendition of it, or to, it's really not a rendition. She really wrote a song that's inspired by it, which incorporates the melody, but it's it's really a whole composition. Um, so this was the text for what we just listened to. Um, and before we listen to Annie's piece, I want to just read this a little excerpt of her program note. It's a little bit long, but I think it it really um, it it does a lot to explain how she's thinking about it and to orient how we're going to listen to it. So Annie writes, I imagine the movement of water as an allegory for life and sorrow, sometimes barely moving, sometimes gushing out of control, often changing course unpredictably, not unlike our own lives during the pandemic. Using fragments from the original folk song, I overlapped still unchanging pitches with slow microtonal glissandi to evoke an undercurrent that is barely perceptible below a rippling surface. At other points, I imagined water moving swiftly flowing down to the sea in a rush of crashing waves made up of overlapping phrases. At the end of the piece, individual pitches gently amass note by note to create pools of floating chords that vary from consonances to clusters, rising and falling during each phrase. The song's melody floats on a bed of sustained notes inspired by a visit to a church in Avignon where I was treated to a surprisingly beautiful organ recital thanks to some unintentional harmonies caused by stuck keys. So with that um, kind of preview into how she's thinking, let's take a listen to, to the composition. This is for string quartet, it's about five minutes long. Um, and, and take a listen for, for sort of things that little fragments of the melody um, and a, a fuller presentation of it later.
what a beautiful piece. I mean, you can really hear it's, uh, um, you know, in integration of or deriv derivation from what Ruth Rubin sang. Yeah, it's a gorgeous piece. And obviously it's, it, you can hear the connection, but it's also a distant connection. It's not a, just an arrangement like we heard in the angle. Um, but, you know, for, to me, this is a, a very interesting thing. And so, you know, with the festival, we really wanted to showcase this, the variety, you know, the, from, from very straightforward uh, classical adaptations to, you know, traditional singing and different adaptations in that kind of um, context to, to contemporary pieces, you know, that are taking it into different directions, um, all with an eye towards how can we make sense of this music? How can we perform it today? How can we um, create new culture with it today um, that keeps it alive and that keeps our, um, you know, keeps keeps the cultural memory going, you know, and, and to keep it going, we need to do different things with it. Um, and, you know, part of it is performing it like we used to, but in, in new ways and new people, but part of it is also reimagining and doing different things with it. So for us, it was very exciting to put all these things side by side. That's so great. So can you maybe just tell us a little more about the, the festival and the other new compositions that were a part of that festival? Sure, yeah. So we commissioned pieces from so let's see, where, where do I even begin? We have pieces from around a dozen composers um, and, I, and I hesitate to, to start naming them because I'll miss someone <laughs> and then I'll feel really bad. But um, what I can show you all is actually, if you go to Yivo's YouTube channel, if I'll just go a few slides extra here. Um, if you go to Yivo's YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash user slash Yivo Institute, you can see that that you can find there a playlist um, with the five events recorded that were part of this concert, um, four concerts, as well as a panel discussion about this Yivo folk song project that I, I told you a little bit about. You can learn a lot more about it um, in this panel discussion, um, which is on our YouTube channel, including from the project the original project lead, Barbara Kirchner Black Gimlet, as well as Eleanor Brzezinski, um, one of our sound archivists who I mentioned a few times earlier, who worked on this project, the digitization of it here at Evo during our time right now, um, as well as Mark Slobin and Josh Waletsky, both of whom worked on the project a little bit in uh, when it was first done in the 70s um, and are both uh, noted um, scholars of, of this music. So they have a very interesting conversation about it. That was part of the, um, the festival. Um, and yeah, we brought about a dozen different composers um, in uh, of different um, distances from, from the Yiddish music world. Some of the composers were graduates of our Yiddish summer program, and so they know Yiddish, and um, and they brought that knowledge with them to their new pieces. But others um, were, you know, like Annie um, or Lainey Pfefferman or um, others are, are from more of the kind of classical world, but have a connection and an interest in um, Yiddish and in Jewish history. And, you know, this provided them an opportunity to kind of like uh, fall in love with uh, these songs. Um, and uh, yeah, we, and we had a huge group of um, contemporary Yiddish singers um, singing a make ev on every night. There is some traditional singing um, of the every different concert. And also this May 22nd concert was all traditional singing. Um, and that was the concert that was dedicated to the Evo Folk Song Project material. Um, so yeah, I encourage anyone who's interested, check out these recordings on our YouTube channel. Um, you can also find them through the Evo website. And this book um, that we made, the kind of program book, it's like a 300 page book. It has program notes um, for the pieces. It has performer and composer biographies. It has um, a kind of resource guide um, for further exploration of these materials. Um, it was a lot of fun to put together um, and you can get it on the Yivo online shop. Um, and then you can read it alongside listening to these concerts um, if you want to explore. And just to show you, the book has the song text for every song in Yiddish, in transliteration, and also in English translation. Um, so it's, it's quite a resource uh for, for this material so uh, if you want to explore further those are the two places Eva's youtube channel and our uh online store to get a copy of that book so in our effort to really share with everyone new uh klezmer and yiddish music today i thought it would be great if you could share with us 
you know, one or depending on time, more of your compositions since, uh, as I noted at the beginning, you're such an accomplished young composer and it'd be great to hear some of the work that you've done. Sure, yeah. So um, one of the things that really interests me in my own work um, that's a little bit different, kind of related, but different from what we're talking about is setting to music Yiddish poetry. Um, and so just in the same way that um, some of the composers we were looking at, you know, take a Yiddish folk song and then do something interesting with it that, that incorporates their own musical style. Um, it's been very inspiring for me to take um, Yiddish poems that I'm really moved by and to do, you know, new musical settings of them um, where I write the melody and the harmony and the accompaniment and all of those things. Um, so I'll, I'll play you one of them. And this... Um, this is the, I'll play you the first song from my album, And All the Days Were Purple. Um, this is a setting of a poem by Anna Margolin, um, which the, the poem, you'll hear in a moment when it's sung, but um, the, the poet, the, the voice of the poem just asks the question, what was, kind of looking back on her life almost, what was my happiness? What was my joy in life? Um, and in asking this question offers some possible answers, but keeps searching um, and ultimately finds that it's the, um, it's both the quotidian, but also the kind of looming specter of death um, that puts life into relief. So it's a very, very beautiful poem. It's very dark and brooding, um, but it's a very moving text. So th this is the, the, it became the first uh, song on my album. So I'll play it.
That's a beautiful piece. Thanks very much. Uh, do you want to maybe share with us how you got into, uh, you know, Yiddish and how this has become like an important force, not only in these Yiddish songs, but, you know, the operas you're working on are all threaded with, uh, you know, Yiddish and Jewish ideas. Yeah. So it's sort of by chance that um, about around seven years ago, um, Yivo reached out to me. I was actually, you know, my background is in music and I, I was helping to run a, a festival of contemporary classical music. Um, and Yivo was looking for someone that was, you know, with a foot outside the, the Yiddish studies world to help bring, you know, all of the wonderful activities that are happening at Yivo to a, to a broader audience. They reached out to me and I came to Evo, and I just thought, wow, this is such an amazing, interesting place. And I didn't actually know that much about it because, as I said, my background was in music and I, I didn't study Yiddish, didn't study Jewish studies. Um, but when, when I came to Evo and I, I took this job running the public programs, I just became completely immersed in the incredible world of Yiddish and of Jewish culture, um, um, you know, which previously it's it's my family background. And, you know, I got a lot of it. Um, you know, from my folks and just kind of by osmosis, um, but being in this kind of academic world of Yiddish and of um, Jewish culture really inspired me and opened up my my eyes and my ears. And I, I took Yiddish classes at Evo um, and I fell in love. And here I am, uh, you know, seven years later or so. And um, it's it's my life. I'm still at Evo. I thought it would be a kind of interesting day job while I was composing, but it turned out that um, it's been really inspiring me, for me for my music as well. Um, as well as a really interesting place to work. So it's been quite a journey. That's great. And um, maybe we could play some final thing in just a minute, but I, should we open up for some questions now? Sure, yeah. Oh, wonderful. So if anyone has a question, really feel free to put it in uh, the chat or raise your hand and we would love to call on you. So Jeff, please. Hi, Alex. Nice to see you. Hi, Jeff. This um, <clears throat> just sort of a, a general question that was sparked by one of the comments I saw in the chat. Um, because so much of Eastern European Jewish music deals with uh, modes, I just wondered how you as a composer or composers more generally kind of approach harmony with that. I was thinking of the the Annie Gosfield piece that you played. There wasn't really any harmony. It was very heterophonic. There were many different voices happening. But I think your music um, delves into harmony a little bit more. So I just thought you could maybe talk about how you approach that and what kind of challenges that might pose. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it, it's a very interesting question. And it's one of the things that you know when we commission composers to do these um, pieces inspired by Yiddish folk song, and just to to be um, clear about it, like some of the composers take a more straightforward approach than Annie did. So some really say, okay, I'm going to do an arrangement and here's my arrangement um, and other, and then you've got kind of Annie is like, here's my fantasy on this folk song. And you've kind of got everything in between um, in terms of what people came back with. But this question of harmony is a really interesting one. You know, what do you do? Um, how do you bring a harmonic world to what was originally a, um, you know, a monophonic, you know, just a, a solo melody um, piece. And, um, you know, there are lots of different approaches, you know, some people take a kind of like, you know, standard, like uh, Western classical music, a tonal music approach, like Joel Engel did. Um, Annie Gosfield is taking this kind of homophonic approach, you're exactly right, where she takes the modal, um, you know, melodic material of the melody, and then just kind of like, anything is fair game with it with those pitches um and also other pitches um but she's kind of so she's thinking modally she's thinking chromatically um and she's kind of like you know just overlaying things very freely um and uh yeah there's a there's a ton of different approaches in my own music i will say like one of the questions i i've gotten a lot about this album um, of settings of Yiddish poetry is why doesn't it use these kind of like Jewish sounding modes? And um, the answer I always give is that, you know, I'm what I'm trying to do in my musical settings is really like bring to life the world of the poem, um, just 
with whatever musical language, with whatever musical material um, really speaks to it. And so these poems um, that I, you know, set to music in this album are for the most part kind of like modern, modernist Yiddish poetry, you know, about life and death and angst and, you know, feelings and emotions and ideas. Um, and so, you know, I'm drawing from this kind of, you know, contemporary classical music palette of just like all of the music I have in my ears and in my heart. Um, and and that's my musical setting. And, you know, and by the same token, if I were if I were setting, say, Emily Dickinson, which I actually have an Emily Dickinson um, setting on the same album, you know, I'm not necessarily turning to um, American folk music because Emily Dickinson's an American, you know, writer. Um, I'm just using the kind of musical material is going to best tell the story that she's telling and my kind of musical analog to it. So by the same token, I'm not necessarily turning to kind of um, Yiddish musical uh, melodies or modes um, in my own, you know, kind of Yiddish in inflected music that's involved with Yiddish poetry or, or Jewish history. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Would you, oh yes, uh, uh, Benson. Oh, uh, we, we need you to, you can unmute please. So, at least today, uh, so much of the music that I've heard and played has a through current, so to speak, of uh, sadness. And, or at least I felt it that way. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that, Alex? Um, well, there, uh, what do I say? In the Evo um, Encyclopedia article, one of the Evo Encyclopedia articles on um, Yiddish music, there's some, there's a quote that says something along the lines of at least half of the Yiddish folk songs are in a minor key. Um, but of course, choosing between major and minor, I'm not actually sure how much that says. I think that um, there is a lot of wonderful, joyful, happy music, and there's also a lot of sad music. Personally, I'm really drawn to sad music and to sad themes. So maybe that's in uh you know kind of like um portrays my selection bias and the things that i thought oh this would be fun to share so i don't i don't want to make any kind of um you know overarching uh you know over generalizations about like whether there's more happy or sad music in the yiddish canon but of course there is that joke you know how do you um make a jewish man happy you play him a really sad song um, but I don't know if there's any kind of credence to that joke. I'm not, I'm just sharing it. <laughs> I'm not going out on the limb and saying it's true. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think it's uh, an interesting insight because so much of the art music that we define as being Jewish, you know, from Bloch, Schoenberg, Bernstein, and many other things as well, that the most expressive aspects of that music is usually things that we would put you know, in the non-happy, uh, yeah. you yeah. know, in the sense that the expressiveness of of a, of the Jewish journey um, includes many things, but the most expressive parts are the ones that are just filled with very deep emotions. Yeah, as I say, a yid is in goalless, a, a Jew is in diaspora, as a Yiddish saying, um, and. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of sores to work through. So David Goldstein posted a message in the chat. Who are some of the Yiddish comedy songwriters in the collection? Um, yeah, that's a there's so much music it's hard to choose from. I mean, I'll say that, you know, in terms of of this particular um festival, we really focused on Yiddish folk song. And so we're looking more at um some songs that have a known author, but in many cases, um kind of anonymous songs that are just collected by, um, you know, fo in folk song collections. Um, but in that in that collection, there are also lots of um, composed pieces and there are also lots of Yiddish theater pieces. Um, and so I suppose um, in thinking of comedy, you can look more in the Yiddish theater, but that itself also has uh, a lot of tragedy and melodrama. Um, 
so in terms of comedy as a kind of category, I don't have like a very good answer for you off the top of my head, but um, you know, there are a lot of wonderful Yiddish theater composers like um, Joseph Ramshinsky and Sholem Sekunda and um, Alexander Olshinetsky and uh, Jacob Jacobs. Um, we're, we're doing a talk at Evo in a few months about Molly Pecan, who in addition to being a really well-known singer, and performer was actually also a really accomplished lyricist. And a lot of the songs that she wrote um, are, are comedic, um, but not by, by no means all. So I would look, yeah, definitely in the Yiddish theater, um, you know, sub collection for, for comedy. Um, and also in the, in the radio, there's a wonderful Yiddish radio. Um, there's a wonderful Yiddish radio uh, project uh, that NPR did with Hank, um, with, um, oh my God. Henry Sapoznik. Henry Sapoznik. I'm, I just had a brain freeze. Um, both yeah. Henry Sapoznik was a really wonderful um, scholar of this material, um, and that that's a great place to look for um, Yiddish comedy because uh, it's just fantastic, um, fantastic radio recordings, and a lot of it's a lot of it's comedic in nature. Yeah, I'll put a link to the Yiddish Radio Project uh, in into the chat here, um, and of course we have to mention with. Yiddish and Jewish comedy, Mickey Katz, although I don't know. Oh, my gosh, of course, the Mickey Katz that. chair. <laughs> I just have to yeah. mention it. Just... Yeah, please mention it away. <laughs> and Mickey Katz, also, we, we've done some great programs at Evo on Mickey Katz um, that are you can check out on our um, our YouTube channel. And that, yeah, so Mickey Katz is a, is a fantastic example. And that's also kind of like, I think of that as a lot of, well, actually, you know, some of Mickey Katz is totally in, in Yiddish. A lot of it's also in Yinglish. Um, so it starts to be a little bit of a gen later generation, but yeah, Mickey Katz, fantastic. So um, maybe since we have a little bit more time, would you like to play another example of um, another work from the festival? Sure, yeah, yeah. I'd be happy to. Let's see what else I brought here. Oh, this is, okay, so this is a really beautiful pair. Um, some of you may know this song, Mein Yingle, um, by Morris Rosenfeld. And the song is, it's from the perspective of a father um, who is singing to his son. And he's heartbroken because he is never there when the son is awake to play with him and to be with him. Um, he, he has to leave for sweatshop work so early that the sun's still sleeping and he comes back so late that the sun is still sleeping. It's just an absolutely beautiful, heart-wrenching um, song. And this wonderful composer, Marty Epstein, who um, lives in the Boston area, um, wrote this fantastic vocalese. And this is also on the more kind of distantly related to the original um, song. Uh, side of the spectrum, sort of like the the Annie Gosfield. Um, but I would love to share it because it's just such a beautiful little vocalese. Um, and what you can listen for as you're listening to it is how, well, I'll, I'll tell you a kind of like um, a little bit of a spoiler, but it's, it's very hard to hear in your first listen. So I'll give it away a little bit. But what she does is she has the, the melody, the original melody kind of woven into her melody bit by bit. Um, and so the first note of every little phrase in her song is one of the notes um, of the original melody. Um, but it's this is very hard to hear. And so it's kind of just like the DNA of this piece is built from this song, but it's, it's, it's buried beneath it. And then at the very end of her, um, of her setting, the a, a whole kind of fragment of the melody that you can really recognize comes out. So actually, I'll, I'll skip ahead a little bit and play the um, play the actual Morris Rosenfeld, so you can just have that in your ear, just a, a stanza or two, and then we can listen to um, the vocalese.
So I'll just leave it there just so you get a little taste of it. That's just two stanzas. Um, and we can go and listen to this, the vocalese that Marty Epstein wrote based on it. Alex, does the volume need to be turned up? It just sounds barely audible. I don't, I'm not sure if I can turn it up any higher. It's a very, it's very soft. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything I can do. But if it's too soft, we can, I can have to, I can leave everyone to listen to it on their own one day. One day. I might have to to invite you all to listen on your own speakers where you can turn it up as as loud as possible. It's um, it's a really beautiful, very intimate. It's actually really quiet even in person, and but it, there's a mad, kind of magical quality to that. But it's not not carrying over Zoom. Not ready for Zoom. All right. Uh, do you have maybe one more example? Sure. Um, yeah. Let's see what else I brought here. I'll go back to the first category um, to share with you the other um, the piece from the Society for Jewish Folk Music um, from way back when. Um, this is an arrangement of um, a lullaby called Unter Sorles Vigla um, by Lazar Siminski. And this is you know, a great example of this kind of flourishing of arrangements and adaptations of Yiddish folk song that happened um, at the turn of the 20th century. So let's give it a listen. And these performers are um, wonderful performers from Bard uh, College Conservatory, who we partnered with on on some of these concerts. Um, and that was just an, another really amazing element of it, bringing in, um, hold on, it's, it's playing, I've got to mute that. Um, bringing in young performers that are not familiar with this repertoire and, and um, giving them the tools to become familiar with it and to learn it and to explore it. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a wonderful joy to to work with so many different musicians. Yeah, it's so well performed. It's so wonderful. 
And we also want to thank uh, Cantor Neil Schwartz, who's giving us information on which modes that we're hearing, which are the Jewish prayer modes. So thank you for that, Cantor Neil Schwartz. So before we um, conclude, Alex, do you want to um, tell us about other YIVO programs that are, are coming up that might be of interest? Um, sure. So what, what do we have coming? I'm, I'm very focused right now on the spring that we haven't announced yet. So while I pull up our calendar to tell you what's happening in the next few weeks, I'll just say we have a very exciting spring, um, which is going to be announced um, within the next month or so. So stay tuned on Yivo's email list and on our um, social media and our website. Um, coming up in the next few weeks, we have we've got the rest of the continuation of this wonderful series with UCLA, um, including uh, uh, an event that I'll be moderating next week on Yiddish uh, cultural and music festivals. Um, and as, as Mark said, also a discussion on the opera Basheva. Um, and other, other than that, coming up at Evo, we've got our Yiddish club with Sonia Kramer this Sunday, um, discussing her work with Yiddish in Rio. Um, and it's moderated by uh, Shane Baker. We have um, a few fellowship lectures um, exploring different topics that fellows you know, are doing research in our, our collections. Um, and the two topics we've got coming up, we've got something about gender in the shtetl tomorrow. And next week we have a talk on Ukrainian Jewish relations on the eve of the Holocaust. Um, and for Christmas, we often do a kind of Jewish Christmas event. Um, and we're doing a talk about um, the reception of Jesus and Shabtai Tzvi as two heretics, um, Jewish heretics, that um, the reception of whom has changed over time among the Jewish community. And we've got the wonderful scholar David Beal giving that talk. So it's on December 22nd on Zoom. Um, and we invite everyone to, to pack their own Chinese food uh, until we're back in person doing it. <laughs> but it'll be very fun. David Beal's a wonderful scholar. So Alex, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to prepare this material and sharing with us this wonderful project of really bringing, you know, new life to um, to, to Yiddish music and letting us see the past and the way that people are artistically forming uh, new ways to to hear Yiddish music. Thank you so much for having me for this conversation, Mark. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the other events in this series. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. As we say at Cage, thank you for being our teacher. <laughs>